Okay, thank you. Um, yep, I'm going to talk about cloud services for the Open Data Cube. Anyone here not in Alex's talk? One? Okay, well, I wasn't going to say too much about the Data Cube anyway, but we'll just work our way through. Um, we're living in a golden age of uh, Earth observation satellites. They, um, uh, there's uh, essential technology improving rapidly. There are multiple space agencies around the world uh, maintaining Earth observation programs. New satellites are being launched regularly, we already heard this morning, and the data from the old ones keeps on coming in. And broadband internet and cloud computing means that we now can access this uh, data in a way that we haven't been able to before. Um, I'm going to start by annoying flat earthers in the audience. Hopefully you haven't gotten me at this conference. Um, there are two interesting orbits for Earth observation. Uh, geostationary orbits, where you stay above one uh, longitude continuously. Um, that's great for looking at sort of one, focusing one area of the world. Uh, you're a lot higher up, so you can see a much broader bit of the Earth at the same time. But uh, you do only see that one third or so of the globe. If you want to cover the whole thing, you've got to do some sort of circumpolar orbit, where you're orbiting over the top of the poles, and the Earth's sort of covering a little strip each time. The Earth rotates beneath you and you gradually cover up the whole world with imagery um, until the, the, those, those, those stripes overlap. Uh, you get a lot of overlap at the poles, not much overlap at the equator, again because the Earth is round. Um, the data fresh off the satellite is not in a very, use, not in a very useful form, um, so we, it has to go through this preliminary processing first. Level zero is, the, is, the, is that raw data direct off the satellite. Uh, we call, uh, once we've added um, georectification, so the lack long of each point, uh, then we call that level one. Um, but most interesting data is the analysis ready data, uh, where we correct for things like uh, satellite uh, observation angle, um, solar instance angle, uh, atmospheric conditions, uh, terrain angle, and so on. Um, yeah, I'll just leave that there. The most interesting satellites to us at the moment are Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. It's not because they're the biggest and the best or the most fancy, it's because they're the ones with the best free and open data policy. Um, <coughs> Sentinel-2 is uh, by far superior. It's a 10 metre resolution as opposed to about 25, 30 metre resolution for Landsat. Um, 13 spectral bands compared to, to 9. Um, covers the Earth in about 10 days um, as opposed to 16. Plus there's two Sentinel-2s, so you actually get it in five days. Um, but the advantage of Landsat is that we have this program going right back to the 80s uh, with, with uh, high quality uh, images uh, on the same orbits. So we can do some really nice longitudinal comparisons with the Landsat data. Uh, Digital Earth Australia uh, are funding this work. Um, it's a platform operated by Geoscience Australia to uh, manage Earth observation imagery uh, for the scientific community and for the general public. Uh, they use the NCI, uh, Supercomputing Computing uh, Platform, and also commercial cloud computing platforms, or one in particular. Um, and so, yeah, yeah no, thanks guys for letting me work on this stuff. Um, <coughs> we had the Open Data Cube. That was, that was, uh, that was sort, of, sort of the starting point. Uh, as Alex told you, it's an open source platform for managing Earth observation data. Um, it's built on X-Array, um, which if you're familiar with uh, pandas, it's uh, like pandas for NumPy. So it just adds this extra um, metadata layer over the top of your NumPy arrays. Uh, it's managed by an international consortium that includes Geoscience Australia and CSIRO. Uh, and we have outreach programs helping uh, developing countries access and make use of their satellite data uh, through, the, through the cube. Um, but until recently, we lacked a robust open source cloud publishing platform. Uh, so we wanted to change that. It was seen as a good strategic thing for the International Consortium. Uh, at the same time, DEA is pushing data into National Map. Um, uh, some of that they were doing directly from the NCI, uh, but there was a uh, perceived need for the additional flexibility <coughs> and scalability of, of cloud deployment. And so that's where we stepped in. Uh, the first step, which Alex also talked about in more detail, is, is COG, was COG support. Um, I'm not going to repeat what Alex said, but uh, the team at GA uh, worked on that and did a, did a stellar job. It uh, works just beautifully. Uh, I was working on this uh, DataCube AWS uh, uh, platform. Uh, AWS just standing for Open Web Services. Uh, it used to just be DataCube WMS, but 
then we started when we implemented WCS as well, and we had to change the name. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's an open source, lightweight web application server. It's written in Python 3, so it can directly integrate with the Open Data Cube. Um, it basically sits on top of the Data Cube and publishes standard uh, geospatial web service protocols, uh, in particular uh, WMS and WCS. Uh, the metadata is stored in a database, but the actual satellite data is downloaded on the fly from S3. Um, this uh, means that we can do a lot of uh, on-the-fly calculations, um, eff effectively in the data cube. Um, we can do a lot of things uh, dynamically very easily that would be impossible in a more traditional web hosting um, geoservice type solution, I guess. Uh, so just comparing uh, the web map service and the web coverage service, if you're not fam familiar with them. Uh, the web map service is great for general purpose web apps. Um, whereas w, the web coverage service is more aimed at uh, scientists and data specialists. Uh, the WMS serves standard 24-bit uh, RGB computer images, um, whereas the WCS would typically return a more rich uh, raster container format like NetCDF or, or, or GeoTIFF. Um, so the question is how we, uh, how we get from uh, this 13-band uh, you know, 12 bit per channel uh, raw data down to a uh, 24 bit image. Um, for web coverage service, you can just request the bands that you want and it'll package them up and send them to you. But for um, web map service, uh, it, uh, it's the web service has this concept of styles. You can request what style you get your tiles in. And I think that's really intended for when the underlying data is, is vector data. So you can say, oh, I, want, I want my roads to be green rather than red or whatever. Um, but we can use it to uh, supply different ways of combining those bands down into a, into a three-band image for visualisation, so we can do different sorts of false colour projections. Um, we also, in, in web maps, we also have uh, get feature info to get uh, the raw data on an individual pixel, which is nice. Um, WMS is fairly clearly specified and most clients are fairly well behaved. Um, web coverage service is a lot harder to read and there's a much bigger divergence in client behaviour as a result. Uh, which is, is challenging. <laughs> uh, so current status, uh, WMS is working superbly. I'll show you a demo later. Um, we uh, support 1.3, which is the most recent version. We work well with most clients. Uh, there's one uh, large commercial client that uh, steadfastly ignores the advertised max height and max width values uh, and insists on requesting very large tiles. But apart from that, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, well, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can do on-the-fly solar angle correction, uh, which is handy for serving level one data if we don't have access to proper analysis-ready data. Uh, and we've got the get rich data coming from get feature. There are some issues around sparse data. Both, both those protocols don't work well with sparse data. So we, we, with the satellite, we've, for any given day, the time slice, we don't have data for the whole Earth. We just have it in these strips. And for any given bit of land, we don't have data for every day. We have data every 5, 10, 16 days, whatever it is. And the, the protocols aren't well designed for that currently. Um, that's an that's a issue with the protocols. Uh, WCS is very much a work in progress. Uh, we're working with 1.0.0 because it's the most easy one to read and understand. But we do want to move on to the more uh, modern protocols once we get our head around it. Uh, Terry.js has a native WCS client that works very well with. Uh, QGS works okay. ArcGIS, we're working on. Um, and again, we've got issues with um, sparse data. So the next step is we're looking at uh, WTMS support. Uh, that will get us around that commercial client that won't read my max height and max out with values. Um, and that should be pretty easy. It's a matter of converting the, the arguments to a WMS argument. Uh, we're going to continue work on WCS. Uh, we're thinking about maybe doing some WPS work, so it would allow some really rich on, uh, online on-demand uh, uh, data processing. Um, we need to do some initial uh, data processing over the data up front to do some extra indexing that's not currently in, in, in the data cube itself. Uh, we're looking at folding that into the data cube. Um, and more data, more deployments. So now I've just got time for a real quick demo, if I'm lucky. Is that going to work? 
yes. And now I've got to find, here it is. Uh, so let's maximise that. Okay, so this is um, Landsat uh, Geomedian data. So I suppose it's just averaged across the whole year. Uh, this one we're looking at now is Landsat 5 from 1988. This is Melbourne, obviously. And this is Melbourne now in um, 2017 uh, from Landsat 8. You can really see the, uh, the industrialisation around the edges and that, that blowout at the west and also the uh, development of docklands in there. It's just a nice little comparison. Um, I'm going to try and really quickly show you some Sentinel-2. So grab that in. Sentinel-2, we'll grab Sentinel-A, add to the map. Um, so uh, can we see these, these, sometimes the polygons show up, sometimes they don't. They're just showing us where the data is. Uh, if we zoom in a bit, they'll actually fill in with the um, overview data. But I'm going to pick out an interesting day I found earlier. <laughs> so up around here, um, there's a really fierce bushfire burning there. Um, that's all smoke over here. Um, if I switch over to this uh, infrared false colour, so this is with uh, green uh, shortwave infrared and near infrared, um, you can really, this here is the burnout area, shows up really well. And those red bits, that's the actual fire. You can see it right through the smoke. Um, and if I zoom back out and go down the bottom to here where it's actually green, um, again, we've got another fire down here. Uh, you can see that fire burning uh, quite clearly. I'll go into RGB. You just see the smoke. We also have um, NDVI there. So this is a vegetation index. It's the normalised difference between the red and near infrared. Uh, green is growing, red is not growing. We conveniently have this little uh, legend down the side for those indexed um, bands. And uh, they are generated again dynamically in the code uh, from, the, from the definition of the, of the band math. So I will leave it there and open up for questions. Just a quick question. Uh, does Open Data Cube also have a Sentinel 1 SAR data? Um, so DEA is not working with that currently, um, but as Alex was saying, the Open Data Cube itself is a, is a generic platform. We can certainly index that and, and, and ingest it, but it's not something that DEA is currently hosting for, um, for, for these purposes. We've got a number of products based around uh, Sentinel 2 and, 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 and the Landsat program, but um, yeah. Uh, all those pictures are from my Twitter feed too, so for, for more pretty Earth observation images, follow me on Twitter. Um, in the next step slide, you said that you're going to work on WPS. Yeah. Have you thought about WCPS? Um, I'm not familiar with that one. That's coverage processing, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. So. <laughs> Uh, we have looked at, the WPS is, is, a, is a sort of long-term plan that we've, we've, uh, so you were we've stepped, we sort of talked about it a few times and it's always been pushed back on priority, but it's certainly something we're thinking about. Yeah, I have a, I have a question that's just partly technical and partly political. Um, what's the relationship between um, the open data key for the OWS system and the logistic data server? <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's, that's a sensitive topic. Um, so we're essentially we're competitors, really. Um, but we, firstly, DISC is not open source, and there was a perceived need within the Open Data Cube Consortium for a DISC-like product that was open source. Uh, so that was one, of the, one motivation for setting up a competitor, essentially. Um, and also, NCI, uh, haven't been as cooperative as, as DA would like in, in getting more, more services added within the NCI. Um, but yeah. it's, it's a sensitive topic, and I've probably already said to